So welcome everyone to the March edition of the Uni Community Hours. This time the Hack Week, Hack Week edition number two, because we still have some topics from, from the Hack Week. If you don't know what the Hack Week is, you can uh, have a look at the other community hours. As always, let me remind you that this uh, session is going to be recorded and the recording is going to be published in YouTube. So if for any reason you don't want to be part of the recording, uh, if you have any questions, if the, instead of talking, just send them to the chat and I will read them for you so the presenters can reply. And with that, let's get right into the agenda. The first topic we will be having is going to be presented by Oscar and is one of the Hack Week projects, in this case, the code coverage for Uni, created by the Cucumber Test Suite. Then Victor is going to present the visualization of salt events. Pascal is going to present one of the things we added, if I recall correctly, in the, in the last release, syncing optional channels from the UI, not only from the command line interface. And then finally, another Hack Week project, this time from Avid, open SCAP usability improvements. And with that, uh, well, yeah, I promised to talk about 2023 04, so when, it, when is it going to be released? I can give you an exact date, but I hope that during the first of second week of uh, April. And uh, yeah, for now our test suite is looking quite good, so I don't expect too many problems this time, but uh, yeah, we will see how things are evolving. As always, if you detect any problems on O3, make sure you report them with uni issues and we will have a look then to try to get them fixed for O4. And with that, Oscar, if you are ready, then I will stop sharing and you can take over. Okay, thank you. Let me see if I can share the screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now should be good. You see my screen? Yes. Okay. So yeah, during the hack week, um, I started a project um, that was well. In fact, we, we continued a project that was the code coverage uh, for the product code from the test suite point of view. So what uh, we are covering in the product code, Java code if we run a test suite. Uh, but then uh, on this same hack week, I decided to extend this to to do what I will present today, which is, which is to suggest a test that can uh, trigger your product changes. So when you do a pull request and you do some changes, uh, you want to know which test will, will cover this uh, uh, these changes so that's the idea so the need so we are working on some java code uh, fixing something improving something and then we we run these uh, changes in our server in our local environment and all seems good we pass some tests and all seems right but then we merge these to the master branch for uni and then boom it it crash it it Face the the continuous integration, and we have some some red in some scenario, and we want to avoid this. We want to have always the the continuous integration test with uh, green. So the proposal is to give more uh, give a tool that give more information to the develop developers about um, what are the tests that can trigger their changes. So they they are sure that with this test they can cover the, the changes they made and, and that way we can we can be uh, in the safe side when we merge the new code instead of running maybe all the full test suite that can takes a lot of time and 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 is uh, harder to do it for each pull request we can do in that way that we we know exactly what are the tests we want to to run uh, for that um, we are using a lot of different frameworks and tools 
Uh, first of all, uh, we will only cover the Java server code uh, here in this proof of concept. And the tool we use for that is Jacoco, which is a tool that uh, kind of uh, listen. Uh, you, um, you load all the Java classes and the source files and with source code files. And with this information, uh, it starts recording when the server starts and it collects all the different um, Java code lines that are triggered during the, your, your different uh, actions you do in the server. Uh, so the idea is that using our test framework, so using uh, Cucumber, we will be uh, starting and stopping uh, the generation of these uh, reports from, from Jacoco that will allow us to know for each test uh, which are the classes that are triggered. And then we will collect all this information and we will push this information to a set uh, set type, uh, in fact, well, a kind of a hash map in, in Redis in a database that, well, for now, it's just a cloud instance in an Amazon Web Service. And finally, what we will do is from the GitHub actions on a pull request, we will be able to uh, request uh, to call to this Redis database to obtain the, the data we need to, to generate this suggested test. So we have uh, a Jenkins pipeline that uh, deploys uh, our uni master branch. We configure the server to include Jacoco. We start recording for each of the tests. And for each of the tests, we will be generating this uh, this entry on the on the Redis database for that will have as a key the class path and as values we'll have a list of uh, all the tests that are uh, triggering this class path. Uh, for now, we do at that level just as a class path, but in fact we will be able with Jacoco to do at any level at um, Java methods or even uh, code lines. But I think. For now, it's good enough if we do a, as a class name path. Uh, and then uh, finally, it will generate a, an XML report uh, with the, for the full test suite. So not for every of the tests, but for the full test suite. And we can also take a look to that. And then in the other side, we have the GitHub action. We will create a pull request with our code. And this will trigger a new GitHub action that will process what are the uh, changed fails, uh, files, but filtering by Java extension, so only the Java classes. And then we will query the uh, ready the Redis database by using the as keys these uh, files, and we will collect all the suggested tests and write it a comment for this. Okay, so now let's do a demo about it. Let's see if I can move. The other screen there. Um, okay. No, that way I can't move it. Okay, this is the the Jenkins pipeline that currently is running. So I don't have a finished uh, pipeline, but it should but be Oscar, good enough. Yep. I still I still see one slide, not the. Pipeline. Uh, are you presenting the the links to the? I was code? showing the no. Then it's wrong. One second. Let me try to stop and share again. Um, you can maybe see now the Jenkins. Uh, yeah, it's working. Now. Okay, so yeah, um, I was showing this uh, Jenkins pipeline that is uh, running currently. Uh, but this will be the um, pipeline that will be run offline. So this is nothing that will run for every uh, pull request in GitHub. This is just running offline periodically. And, and this will generate and push the content to this Redis database. Um, we, we have a configuration in the, in the server from the 
from the main TF of the Terraform file, when we deploy, we will configure in the, the Java server to include this, this Java agent here, Yakoko agent with all this information and including only uh, yeah, the, the classes we want. We will not be parsing everything, but only what we want and uh, the kind of uh, way to communicate with this. Uh, everything. Then we have this pipeline, which is the pipeline that I was showing running, um, where we have a new stage that is the enable Jacoco agent that will configure, will download, in fact, the Jacoco agent and configure the Tomcat with uh, with this configuration. Uh, it will also download the last code of Uni master in that way, because having this, we will pass this to the Jacoco tool and we'll have the last source code. And then when we do the final stage, we will be uh, also uh, dumping this test co coverage to show the, the full report. Um, then, well, yeah, at that point, what I can maybe share is that in, in the pipeline, when it finished, but also during the pipeline, you will have access in, in the server to this folder, Jacoco Cucumber report, where you can order by coverage and we can click on some of them. For instance, this one, you have the source files and then inside it, you can see which are the triggered uh, lines and what are not triggered. Maybe this one is not the best example, but yeah, maybe here. Have something. Yeah, well, mm, the idea is that it will show if uh, uh, the line is triggered or not. The ones that are in red are not triggered. The ones that are in green, they are triggered at some point. Uh, so yeah, this is the full uh, report. And then we have the part for the GitHub action. On the GitHub action, we created a new GitHub action with uh, some uh, secrets for, for the Redis connection. And we have a JavaScript that will call to this Redis to generate the, the yeah, the, to collect and generate this comment with all the tests. Um, well, more details on this pull request uh, um, where I have all the code that we have on the test framework. We have some part on the test framework that will be generating for each of the tests. We will be doing a jump, dumping the Java, the Jacoco report and then some examples. Here, for instance, I selected uh, an example of a refactor or audit manager. So here we have this new comment that you can expand uh, here, uh, where you can see the two tests that are covering this pull request. So the changes on audit manager can, can be covered with this have other example like here that we are doing some changes on Cobbler. And you can see that here it shows some more because there are more tests that are triggering in fact this part of Cobbler. But if you read them, they are kind of related with Cobbler at some points. So it, sometimes, yeah, might be weird because you have some, some tests that uh, doesn't look related to to cobbler, but in fact, at some point, they are touching some line of these uh, class paths and change it, uh, change it here in the pull request. Others like this one, for instance, it can be a bigger list, but yeah, but that, that's the idea. Um, yeah, that's all that I wanted to show. I'm not sure if I can come back to the slide. Let me stop again, share again. But maybe, maybe meanwhile, we can take some questions. If someone yeah. has any, go ahead. Otherwise, I have some already. Okay. 
Um, this is Stefan here. I've got a couple of questions actually being completely new to, uh, let's say, testing, automated testing, and uh, I would like to focus on that one more. Um, do I understand it correctly that I will not be able to see the test results still? The test results uh, of these, uh, you, this is not for tests. In fact, this is only to show you a um, suggested list of tests that ah, you I will see. need to run it uh, later in your in your environment. This is just for the suggestion of tests. Okay, understood now. Thank you. So we use we we are running all the tests, but it's just to collect all the information of what is triggering, uh, what are the tests triggering uh, the class paths. But yeah, the tests you need to run separately. But we have I'm not I'm not sure if uh, it's already presented or it will be presented. But we also have uh, uh, some proof of concept to run that these tests in GitHub Actions that we might show at some point. You just replied to one of my, my comments, exactly, because uh, Jordi is not here today, so he cannot present this. We hope that he will be able to present it in the next next session for April, worst case May, but yes, he is working on a project to run the acceptance test suite, part of it at least, with GitHub Actions, and in that case, you will see the test results. So this is very cool, because now with the project with uh, from Oscar, you will get uh, suggestion for tests, and, Maybe you cannot run the complete list of those tests with uh, Cucumber on pull requests, but at least some of them for sure you will be able to run them. Others you can still um, run them using the test with Suma form locally, but at least it's, this will take already out some, some work of the table, which is really, really great. So yeah, I think this is a very, very useful tool, uh, Oscar. What and the, I was the idea about this project is to combine this project with the project of uh, Jordi too about the Git, uh, GitHub Actions running uh, test, and we will mm -hmm. combine both. So uh, this GitHub Actions uh, running the test will be able to run automatically only the test that we suggest. Mm -hmm. That's the next step. That's very cool indeed. Then. then my only question would be, I see that you created a separate test suite for uh, generating the report. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we could integrate this with the main test suite so we don't have to yeah, maintain two separate test suites. Would that be doable? Is there any reason to have doable, Jacob Doable, it would be. But I prefer to not do it because it consumes a lot. Jacoco tool, it's uh, it's yeah, kind of a sniffing uh, all the time there in the in the server, and it means that it's uh, consuming resources. I uh -huh. even created a server with more memory than the one we are using now on CI to yeah to be able to handle it uh, kind of quick Ma enough. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. It's about so, performance. Uh, yeah, possible performance problem makes all the sense. Yes. Okay, thanks. I don't have any other questions, but I see Cedric wants to ask something. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I, it seems that I've seen some pull requests where the suggestions were so numerous that I it smells like false positives. Um, how how to to work with these? Should we just ping there you? There is about... a way. There is a way to improve this, uh, but it it will be harder because we need to make it uh, smarter. But it's possible. Uh, the thing is, currently we are only um, collecting this information as a class path level, as I was saying, we we class path layer. So if you are at some point from the test uh, triggering some code line of the class path, this test will be included in the class path. Even if uh, the method you are, you are modifying is not uh, uh, triggered by this test. So the way to fix it, or improve it is working uh, by Java methods. Uh, so you can collect a class path plus Java method, and then you you will be able to yeah do it more fine grain. Could be another a step also we can do on this. And and how how would the database explode if we go this way? I hope. 
not that much, but at the end, it's just a Redis database with uh, key values. It should not be that much, I think. Okay. Okay, I have more request than, uh, than a question. I think it would be great if you can maybe send an announcement to the uni devil list, because then that way we can also follow their uh, the discussion and people can ask more questions to, to you about this or clarification or even ideas. Okay, sure. Okay, then if there are no more questions, we will switch to our next speaker. Victor, how about visual, visualizing salt events? Victor, what? Uh, yeah. Hi, hope you see me well. Let me share the screen. Oh. Screen. Hope you should see the screen right now. Yeah, I see Microsoft Teams. Oh, great. So uh, let me show a couple of slides, first of all. Yeah, and yeah, just to remind, I'm Victor Zuskov. And I'm going to show you some uh, project uh, which actually started about three years ago. And uh, first of all, I'll give you some background information. What was the issue we are trying tried to solve on this time and uh, some extra details about the challenges we have the uh, and what what issues are we trying to solve with this kind of tool and uh, the as i mentioned the project started about three years ago with the huge uh, dump of the salt and bus captured during the a uh, huge state applied process on the customer's environment and the environment itself is quite huge. If you take a look on the bottom line, it mentions that the, there are 25,000 of millions uh, registered millions was slightly more, but during this capture, the active millions have this, this number and uh, also mentioned the number of uh, requests and responses on state applies and the the sizes of this dump itself and the main challenge of this uh, process is that it's not that clear what's going on on the salt uh, event uh, salt la level let's say so you can see the events on the uh, salt event bus but uh, it's hard to distinguish uh, distinguish which of them are useful which of them you should take care about so need some attention to fix something or not and uh, yeah it's really challenging in such environments and uh, on the list of the uh, such challenges is how many events processed by salt master if it's still alive or if the salt master process have some issues already some crashes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, what exactly events are processed currently? If, uh, if these events are state applies or any other kind of events, and uh, we also should uh, take care about some specific event, which could events which are not huge amount, but in case of uh, single event, it could affect the whole process of running the rest. Uh, amount of the events actually and uh, uh, one of the challenges i'm trying to solve in this particular project was the kind of show how how um, these important events on the uh, among the huge amount of different ones and uh, one of the focuses uh, extra focuses of this proof of concept uh, project is to uh, provide a kind of debugging and profiling data for to improve the uh, states itself. So uh, let's let me show the how it was long time before. As I said, it was three years ago. Let me restart the service and it should show the process from scratch. So yeah, in this implementation, the uh, script just reads the dump file and show the incremental process of uh, uh, state apply on, on the systems and uh, it distinguished the uh, state applied for failed failed on the minions so on on some particular minions uh, the particular state could fail every time or 
at least it could uh, apply it once succeeded, but uh, on x ne next apply, it could change the state uh, to failed or, or vice versa. It depends on the uh, on the situation and depends on the exact state. Actually, we should take care about the uh, the coverage of the deployment of some some state we are trying to apply on this huge amount of systems. So it was, as I said, three years ago. In this uh, project, I tried to clean up the code as it was a kind of POC project and quite ugly inside, uh, a lot of copy paste, etc. And uh, uh, during the first presentation of this POC project, if I remember correctly, Michael Kalman suggested to uh, uh to provide the kind of uh, exporter to show this uh, data on the grafana page and as i can show you now i did it on the on on the prometheus and uh, exported the data to the grafana and we can extract them some uh some event types on the first panel uh the tricky thing here is that uh, topmost point salt events, it's a kind of uh, summary for the rest on the below. And uh, if you take a look carefully, then you will see that uh, this green line is covered by the, by the other one. And it means actually that uh, it's the full summary of the all of the rest events. And if we see some drift between these two lines, then we could suggest that uh, there are some amount of events not covered with the uh, with the categorization of the of the events. So we need to take care sometimes and add extra. And as I mentioned, one of the challenges was to show the single events on the uh, on the graph where we have. Uh, huge amount of the events per second, per, per hour, etc. And in this case, I am showing these events on the uh, negative side of the graph. So you can see this yellow uh, tick here and the red one. It means that uh, in this certain uh, point, we have the salt key deletion event. And on this uh, point, we have the event with the value streamed inside the event, it's kind of uh, issue when uh, the uh, event size is reaching the limit by size and the uh, salt itself is cutting the event which could lead to the improper rendering on the Java site and uh, could affect the uh, proper uh, processing the data from the minion and so in this case. The next chart is showing the uh, amount of the events by, divided by the request and responses. Requests are on the bottom side, on the top side, and uh, responses on the bottom side, negative side. So you can see that uh, there are some pikes. Uh, it means that uh, the targeted system w was by, for example, by the uh, globs or lists. And uh, for the single request, we have a lot of responses from the different minions. So the third chart is showing the uh, the state applied process in this case, and we divide it by the succeeded failed states having errors and uh, states which was applied with the test flag shown. And uh, additionally, as I mentioned, one of the uh, one of the issues I'm trying to solve uh, was the kind of debugging or profiling the states and oops. so for this one we have the list of the and the progress of the state applyment of different states and also the uh, time taken for the uh, for the applying on the minion how much time uh, the parts of the state take to be applied on the minion and uh, if it uh, exceeded some amount of time then we should take care and probably optimize why it happening in this particular case uh, some of the state takes too much time just because they are trying to wait for uh, for refreshing the repositories and as the environment is quite spread 
and limit it with the bandwidth so it takes much time on just to refresh on the uh, yeah just on the refresh so uh, the rest part of the original POC is not yet implemented so uh, it just exports the data to the to the Prometheus but uh, it's not providing the ways to affect the deployment process as it was in the original POC project and I'm going to uh, finish it in maybe maybe a month or or less, let's say. So um, I think that's it. Uh, I haven't published the project yet, but uh, there is already a placeholder on, on the GitHub. I hope I will finish with the, some cleanups and uh, publish it on the, maybe next week. So I think that's it for my side. Well, I think we will publish it as, uh, as one of the Ujuni projects, right? Uh, the project itself. I think that should be yeah. doable. Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm. Uh, and actually, I forget to mention that now it uh, utilizes a lot of the uh, parts of the salt itself, and it's a kind of uh, extension for salt. And for example, it uses the uh, process management subsystem from salt, etc. And uh, I, I'm trying to to do it much better than the original POC, let's say. <laughs> Not to be so. The original project was the single huge script, but now it's more or less divided and, and, and logically spread. So, any other questions? Well, I um, really hope to see to see this as soon as possible at the unit project <laughs> because I can foresee a lot of interest from the community to having a look at how salt is behaving for sure. Yeah, I think it could be interesting for for the customers having the large environments that, as it's extremely hard to understand what's going on on the salt layer level and uh, to find out the root cause of some issues, and yeah, on, on these graphs we can uh, can align these uh, goals and etc. of the events with the uh, utilization of the master proxies, and I think it makes it much easier. Yeah, Pablo, I see your hand. Yeah, it's not a question, but uh, this looks really nice, Victor. Thank you very much. Um, I am yeah, looking forward for for having this in the POC. I mean, the in the Uni repo and and yeah, start playing with it. So thank you, man. Yeah, thanks you. Okay, then thanks a lot for the presentation, Victor. And if there are no more questions, then now it's the turn for. Pascal, syncing optional channels from the UI and not just from the command line interface. Go ahead, please. Okay, hi. First of all, I guess you can hear me fine. Let me yeah. try to share my screen first. So you should see my browser now, ideally. Yes, I see a SUSE manager. That is great. Um, yeah, just ignore the Susan manager and pretend there is an Oyuni. Um, so um, from my side, no slides this time since it's just a short, small thing. And I thought it would be the best thing to just give a short demo. So this is about adding optional channels to the UI. And yeah, before you need it to use uh, something like MGR sync to do that, now you can just, uh, yeah, just go to the products page and wait until the list is there. Look for some product that you have installed. And then this was already here. There is this list of the product channels and you see here mandatory channels and optional channels. And what is new is that you now have these checkboxes in the optional channels and you can just check one of them and confirm to, and this will basically schedule the, the syncing of the optional channel. So you can just do it for this one quickly. 
right. And you will so now see uh, that soon for this one is in progress. Um, so now, if you want to do that on some product that you didn't have installed yet, let's see, for instance, this leap for 15.4. Um, so you first, so this is the UI you used to see before where you have the mandatory and optional channels. In order to add optional channels, you need to first add this, this product to your list. And afterwards, it should appear in a second. Right. Let's wait until the list reappears. So we just scheduled this leap 15.4 for syncing now. Dum -dum -dum -dum. Yeah, there it is. And now while this is syncing, you can also add optional channels that you choose to add. I'm not going to click confirm here again. It's just going to work the same way I showed you before. Just select the optional channels here. If you want to add any of these, it also works on, on sub channels, like for the client tools, for instance, you see there are also some optional channels. You can do the same thing here, just do that. So basically you can install all the optional channels here that yeah, manager's sync list would, would give you before. Just no need to use the CLI anymore. Yeah, that's all I have to show. Yeah, this is it. Are there any questions? Let me switch over to Teams again. Nothing so far. So no questions, but very, very nice because in particular case, even if I'm a heavy user of command line interface for some things like adding the products and syncing them, I always use the setup wizard. And now having the possibility of doing that with the optional channels is really great. So thanks a lot for that. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> okay, there are no questions. And I'm going to stop sharing. OK, and, yeah. and thank, you. thank you very much, Pascal. Our next presenter for the week uh, is Abit with his Hagwit project, OpenSCAP Usability Improvements. Are you ready, Abit? Yeah, I am. Thank you, Julio. Now let me share my slides. It's loading. Come on. OK, I guess you can see my slides, right? Yes. OK, perfect. So yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, I'll quickly, I have a couple of slides. Uh, for some of you, it might be boring because you already saw it. But for some uh, of you, it could be still interesting. So we will see how it was before and what we changed. Uh, it's mostly revolves around the usability part of open uh, of OpenScape integration with Zoom Manager. And we changed some bits uh, to make it a bit more interesting. Um, so, what we changed is really that yeah, um, before uh, it was the case that yeah, uh, every client uh, that you wanted to uh, run OpenScap against had to have the content. You had to install those uh, SCAP security guide uh, packages and then use it. Uh, so that's one thing that we have changed. So now all the content which reside on the server side and we will only move that to the client at runtime whenever we need it. But other than that, everything will stay at server side. This is a bit more secure and also um, it, 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 uh, it results in uh, one less step. So you don't need to install those packages. All the client needs is just a scanner and that would be it. Uh, second thing that we have changed is that yeah, we now made it easier to uh, use the tailoring file. Uh, thing is that with SCAP, uh, it's uh, we the so vendor only provides the baselines, and then user mostly use the tailoring files to change to add those baselines. They either add them or remove them, and only part that is really meaningful to them, uh, they take care of that one, and that is it. Um, one thing that we further changed is that yeah, now we made it easier to apply the remediation also right from Zuzi Manager. Of course, it was also possible in the past, but there were quite a few steps to do that. 
uh, from using the remote commands. Uh, but now it's more like inline and a bit seamless, I would say. And doing all this, of course, uh, it also in, improved um, the user experience and uh, I believe the UI as well. Um, I'll move to the demo part because yeah, that will be, I guess, a bit more interesting than this slide. So just give me a moment. Uh, yeah, I believe you can see already Susie Manuel. Oh, sorry, uni, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly, yeah, uni. Okay, okay. Yeah, just to make sure uh, that we have uh, no security guide. So, yeah, only thing that we have is really the installer or the scanner, and we don't have anything else. Now, go back to how it looked like before. Uh, they were, uh, so this, is, this was the current state, um, or, or the previous state, I would say. Uh, current in a way that, yeah, this code, the uh, new code is still not merged. So this is actually the current state. In other words, uh, they were all free in text. So user had to know the path of uh, the data stream files uh, and all the other arguments. Uh, they need to understand it. And it was pretty hard to actually make it work. What we have changed here is, um, make it a bit more user friendly. So now you will have all the content. Uh, that means pretty much every distribution that uh, Unisports, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, Oracle, Linux, RHEL, OpenSUSE. Um, I will select slash 15 because this is what my minion is. And based on this selection, it will actually load all the profiles that are out there uh, against this. And in this particular case, I am going to select this uh, these stick. Uh, I will just, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to use trailing file at this moment. We will use that in the next step to make sure that they are working. I just schedule this thing and I'll see how long does it take to actually. Let's give it a few seconds. Yeah, I mean, what I was mentioning in the chat that you said a bit more user friendly. I don't agree. I think it's way more user friendly. <laughs> I believe so. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, uh, but before, yeah, let's not wait for this to finish. I'll just, we will just schedule another scan, but this time with a tethering file and see how does it change. Um, so, this trailing file, I will show how we are uploading uh, or user can upload a trailing file as well. Uh, this is only the subset of what you see in the main base um, uh, baseline that uh, vendor provide in case uh, in this case Zuse. So we are we just we are adding some uh, some of those uh, rules uh, or uh, against the Chrome jobs uh, when it comes to security. And yeah, I will just schedule that another one. Let's see if the first one has been finished. So first one is finished, and now we have the one that is already uh, with the trailing file. I'll go back. And yeah, you see that yeah, this was the one that we already had scheduled, uh, and this was like 24 percent. Um, and now you can also see that there is an option to remediate. I'm not going to remediate these big ones because they look scary. <laughs> uh, this is, by the way, all the bash script. So yeah. And there will be an option to update. Uh, I mean, you don't. Uh, you can always go and update your own uh, remediation if you are good enough uh, with the best script. So you can do that as well. But this is one that is being supplied by the vendor. So I'm not going to add this one, uh, but uh, I'll be waiting for this one. So as you see uh, before, we when we um, run the scan with whatever we get from the vendor. Uh, it run uh, around uh, 562 uh, rules, uh, and among them, 58 was successful, 157 one failed. Overall compliance for 24%. Uh, with the trailing file, I reduced the number, and um, okay, this was this is probably not a number. This is something different. I I, I need to check. But now only seven are um, passing, and uh, just one is failing, and overall compliance is 88%. Our goal is to receive like the 100% compile compliance, which is kind of dreams, uh, which is usually not the case, but yeah, in this case, let's try. So there is this one remediation against this one. 
you can apply it uh, right from here. So uh, let's just apply it. Um, let's see if you know, OK, the mediation is already applied, as you can see. Yeah. And then I'll go and I'll do the same again. Uh, because that's how we would like, or we can check that yeah, if remediation really worked or not. I'll go back, select here. Uh, this is, by the way, the profile that was part of the steering file. I know there's a bit of vocabulary around OpenScape, so yeah, uh, could be there are some terms that could be confusing, so apologies for that, but yeah, that's how an OpenScape actually is. Um, yeah, I have scheduled again, go back. Come here, let's see, finish. OK, it's already finished in the meanwhile. And yeah, so remediation worked. And now we have compliance at 100%. So that was about this thing. One thing that I haven't showed was the, mm, yeah. So now you can actually upload the trailing file right from here. So in the past, you could do that. You could still upload your trailing file uh, as a part of configuration channel and then apply that configuration channel and that would be it. But now it's a bit more easier, a bit more like grouped better. And now you can actually uh, just go and upload your trailing file right, right, right from here. Uh, yeah, um, I guess I don't have anything, but yeah, I will just do that. So you can yeah, just and do that and you will have your telling file. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. If you have any questions. Yeah, there are two questions in the chat. The first one is if the remediation also works for Ansible code, because there are some catalogs out there that supply Ansible code rather than shell code. Uh, no. Uh, uh, this, uh, um, so I only passed um, bash one, so it's it's not hard to uh, uh, pass the Ansible as once, but we went with uh, uh, with with the one that are based on bash, so bash scripts really. Okay, and then the second question, I know half of the <laughs> of the reply. When will these updates uh, to open SCAP be, uh, will be available in Susemana year? I know for sure that for the next major version, but David, do we have any plans for the current version of, of Susemana year? Uh, well, it um, Zuzi Manje, uh, 5.0. So initially, yeah, we had different plans, but yeah, it's a bit big change and we don't want to uh, really disturb what is already out there. So it will be part of 5.0, but Uni will get much earlier. I just didn't have time to actually uh, already backport to uh, Uni, and there's still quite a few uh, changes that I had to make. Yeah, actually, yeah, I will just switch uh, back to the slide to show um, what are the plans really. Let me uh, just go back to my slides. What was it? Yeah, this one. I think you maybe need to. Ah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So what we are going planning to do is, yeah, code cleanup. It's still. Uh, I didn't get time to be honest after Hack Week to actually work on this project. So yeah, code is still in pretty bad state. So I need to clean up that part. Um, remote content. You know, when uh, if you see here, if you go back in. Okay, I don't have. <laughs> I have already switched my. Um, my screen, but yeah, let me just check. Um, sorry, yeah, yeah. So remote content is uh, like you know um, is a big part of uh, scab content. Most of the vendors they upload um, or update this information on uh, on regular intervals, so they up uh, update on daily basis. And I guess that's similar uh, um, with the Red Hat. Um, those are some big files. Um, and uh, they are not available offline, so you need to download every time you want to do it uh, from the FTP or HTTP server and then use them. Uh, we would like to download those files on uh, pretty much regular basis on Zuzim and Jet server, so you could actually uh, use them in, in an offline way um, where you don't need to access uh, outside uh, on the internet. So that's another thing that we would like to change. So user could actually, you know, use the remote content as well. Uh, we would like to add this thing in SSM as well. 
actually it's already there, but uh, yeah, this uh, these changes that you just saw. So that will be it. API, of course, we will be providing API. We will need to modify the existing. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so it will break probably some of the things that a user will need to modify, or maybe we could yeah uh, keep the old endpoints as well and somehow made it work uh, alongside the new one. Um, yeah, as you saw, some of the pages were still in struts. Some of the pages have been already migrated uh, and using Jact. So the, we need to get rid of uh, those uh, pages that are still on struts. Documentation, of course, uh, we cover pretty good actually already uh, documentation part, but of course there are already something that we could do better. Testing and recurrent scans. Yeah, you know uh, the power uh, that is um, that would really come and um, made this whole feature useful is have the ability to uh, perform these scans on recurrent basis. Not every time go there and manually schedule that scan and then see if it passed or failed. But actually, yeah, you just do it uh, um, uh, once and then it it's uh, it be done like we uh, every week or every day or every month. Good thing is that yeah, we are already working on rec um, uh, recurrent states thingy, and uh, as soon as we are done, we are uh, we are designing it in a way that yeah, we could easily extend to recurrent uh, like this open scape and CLM and all those other things that could be do on um, recurrent basis. So yeah, that's another thing that I guess would really make this feature complete. And yeah, that's it actually. So if you have any other questions. Uh, no, Don, I don't have a GitHub link. It's mostly PR and um, it's uh, I'll I'll be yeah, just publishing the PR or creating the PR in Union Track team. Okay, anyway, it's looking great. So yeah, keep up the good work and let's hope we will see this merge soon available for the community. Sure, thank you. Okay, and if there are no more questions, then Avid was the last presenter for today. We still have like five, six minutes as always for an open round of questions, suggestions, anything that is in your mind and you want to ask us or discuss. I think Cedric wants to say something already. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I just want to remind that there is one week left for students to apply for Google Summer of Code uh, with um, Uyuni, and Uyuni is part of the OpenSUSE organization for Google Summer of Code. Um, I have seen that Rachel is one of the students who is looking forward to work with us in this call. Um, well, I, ho I hope to see more students in the future. Oh yeah, then of course for all the students that are going to be part of the Google Summer of Code. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't notice that. Then a special welcome for you and. Hope to be working with you well real soon. When is the, the starting in June, Cedric? Uh, the starting uh, the start is in, in May, if I recall correctly. But well, nothing is set in stone yet because uh, students are not even selected. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, then. But yeah, keep coming you're... the good applications. Exactly, yeah. Donald, go ahead. Yeah, it helps if you take yourself off mute. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I have a question, and this came from uh, a user. Is there any plan for, or does anybody have experience with Photon Linux? So, um, so I put a link in the chat here. It's a VMware product project, uh, and it's designed to be somewhat like um, Leap Micro or a, a tool to run virtualization and or or containers on top of it. All the repositories are publicly available, um, but 
but it's a, it's a VMware owned pro project. And I have some uh, users that are using VMware and are wondering if Uyuni can be enabled to support it. Anybody else seen it out there in the wild? I didn't see it, but I just had a look at the repositories. They seem to be using RPMs, right? So unless I'm very wrong and I was looking at the wrong folders. Yeah, yeah. So my experience right now with it is that you can replicate, you know, create custom repositories and replicate them. And you have um, <clears throat> it. It does see the patches, but it doesn't put them into the database. So the metadata for patches would need to be enabled. Uh, secondly, it does certificates in a different way than Red Hat. The certificate handling is more like uh, Debian. Ubuntu, where the certs are not put in Etsy PKI trust anchors, they're put in Etsy SSL certs. So high states fail mm -hmm. on it. Uh, that's kind of my experience. <laughs> I can get it registered. Um, and obviously, because it's VMware, they include salt in the distribution. So that's one nice thing is that you can use the client that's built into it. It is Salt 3005 though. And I was testing with Photon 4, which is uh, the most, is the latest released version. There is a beta right now for Photon 5. But um, anyway, wow. that was my experience with it. And I just wondered if anybody else had uh, interest or had experience with it. I would like to have a look at that at some point. Not, um, not sure if I learn in Tuesday, maybe waiting until the hack week is too much. You know that I spend always time there. But yeah, well, in the end, if Sol 3005 was working with 3004, it's, well, it's your luck. It, it should work, but you know. It's yeah, it's luck. luck. <laughs> it's luck. I mean, so when will we put... Salt 3005 into Uyuni. Is that going to happen this summer? Well, or maybe, I don't know if we have Pablo here, didn't review the list maybe of participants. We skip to 3006. Maybe, yeah, 3006, most likely. It's still not completely decided, but that is the most likely situation. And in that case, of course, 2005 should work still. Most likely, if we ever want to support this in the uni, I would rather much produce the bundle for this if we cannot reproduce, uh, reuse the bundle from any other Red Hat uh, version. And then fixing the problems with these certificates should not be that complicated from my experience, but without having a look at the code, maybe I'm talking too fast here. The thing that would be out of my scope, I guess, would be, uh, yeah, the patching patching problems. Yeah, but obviously, I mean, certificates kind of blow the whole thing up. So it's like, you know, my repositories, you know, none of my client stuff is certified, high states fail and all blows up. Anyways, okay, I won't bug you anymore. I just uh, was curious. Suggestion, if you want to see this, uh, at the very least, I would open a request at the uni repository. Okay, I can do that. Okay, and we are almost in time, only one minute later. If we, I mean, one minute late, sorry. If we don't have any other last minute things, then I would like to thank you everyone for participating, for participating to the presenters for presenting and handling all the questions and all the very interesting things that were presented. And I hope to see you in one month. The next uh, meeting is going to happen in April 28th. And stay tuned for the release of Uni 2023-04. Until the next community hours, as always, remember you can 
contact us and the community at the uh, Gitter mailing lists and the Uyuni issues. So hope you will be having a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you soon again. Bye bye. Enjoy. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Right. Thank you.